Hello from hell. Remember, we're all in hell. I just have the cooler backdrop. Uh, this is Stone Soup Poetry. And every poem you read, and more importantly, every vote uh, for Blue you make on Tuesday, gets us uh, an, inch, an inch out of hell, at least, or maybe a centimeter. After all, we are still voting Democrat to keep Trump out. So, we're not, you know, it's, it's, it's a millimeter of progress at best. But that keeps us out of hell, and that will help us out. And not hell us out. Okay, I have no puns today. I'm out. I, I am out of clever wordplay. I expect most of us are too. I just wrote my un, most un, uninspired American haiku because I'm just like, you know, I'm kind of hoping after Tuesday I don't have to do them anymore. Or at least not for a while. Or at least not on the same motherfucking topic. But um, let <laughs> us... Let us have our uh, last final gathering. Uh, Beauty is hopefully going to be returning at the end of uh, November. She had to call out, yes, last week due to health reasons. And uh, I was trying to hold this spot to get her back. Um, no go. I was trying to get uh, Ryan Rat Travis, but then he performed for the Garage Poets. And uh, I'm like, I, I can't, I can't uh, ask him to do no, another show so close. But it would be nice to get Ryan Rat Travis back regardless um so we'll have some announcements we should have nearly a full month except for the week of thanksgiving i don't think it's a it's wise even for a remote session to uh <laughs> to gather the wednesday before but uh let's get to the let's get to the uh shoe and uh, our first person on the round robin open mic as chosen by the ramdenator 5000 is mr generalissimo brian franco Probably just because the Ramdenator likes his new icon. Oh, oh yes. I I am going to start a, a GoFundMe for my Krusty the Crown plastic surgery so I can look like Krusty for the rest of my life. It might be an improvement. I don't know. Um. So. I, <laughs> oh, who who did that? Was that a real Krusty or was that just an image? That was that was, that was me. Oh well, that was good. The older I get, the more the better I get at my crusty impression, which may not be a good thing. <laughs> you know, like it's yeah, but what are you gonna do? But I'm sorry, proceed. Okay, well, you know, Krusty Krusty, his real name is Herschel Krustovsky. Oh, that would be funny if I changed my name legally to Herschel Krustovsky. <laughs> I wonder if I get a, a cease and desist letter. Okay, so the first poem is Olives. Olives. Olives are olives are black, olives are green, olives are purple. Olives are the best part of a martini. Olives are the best beer food. Olives are the best wine food. In Spain, the land of my ancestral heritage, a place I've never been. I've been told they put free bowls of fruity, yummy olives on bars and restaurant tables. In America, we get peanuts and pretzels. Olives. Olives, to be complete, must have the pit. Pope John Paul II made it made a papal decree declaring it a sacrilege to serve a salad in the Vatican City with pitted olives. Olives. Olives are olives are like heroin to the taste buds of a Sephardic Jew. I am a Sephardic Jew. I am proud to be a Sephardic Jew. I was born that way. I refuse to have canned pitted California olives in my home or fridge. It would be a sacrilege. And that was the first poem that became a request poem in my long storied uh, journey of being a poet. Um, and so when I was looking for this poem somewhere in the O's is this piece called Of Mice and Monopoly. I don't know why Monopoly is not. Uh, I've been shaking. Excuse me. Can we... Mute people that I hear conversations. I'm sorry. I've been. It's okay. You're good. I've been shaving daily since I was 16. I used to be a diligent daily shaver. I never skipped shaving for more than three days. If I got a little case of the flu or bronchitis, maybe a week, beards with too much growth can get both itchy and sweaty. But after I moved to Maine in 2001 at age 35, in my first winter as a Mainer, I threw clean cut convention to the wind. Maintaining a beard is not an is not overly easy. Deciding on a shape and keeping it trimmed properly can be harrowing, to say the least. 
There are beard oils and other such products to improve the wily appearance of a beard for hair, beard hair for people like me whose beards resemble wired hair terriers. Unfortunately, these products cause me to break out. Maintaining even sculpting is something I often fail at. So as a rule, I completely shave off my beard two or three times a year. I call it balding my face. I recently had minor routine surgery. I balded my face the day before I checked in the hospital. Recovery provided me six weeks of all types of pain and other side effects. My beard was fully ignored and never sculpted or trimmed. It became an unkempt rat's nest. Finally, close to three months after the day before the surgery, I balded my face. I put newspaper in the sink to catch the hair. When I looked down, there was movement. A small family of mice were climbing through the hair in the sink. The father, who was wearing a very expensive-looking fedora, wagged his index paw at me and yelled at me, How dare you destroy our home? You'll be hearing from my lawyer. A few years back after my Uncle Sam died, my brothers and I went to Tucson to clean his home. He had been homebound due to arthritis, which we discovered after he didn't travel to my mother's funeral. Actually, a neighbor checked in on him and his partner, who had Parkinson's every now and then. He was able to Uber to grocery stores and cook until it became difficult. Then the neighbor cooked meals for them and stored the food in the fridge. After Uncle Sam's death, we tried starting his car to no avail. We opened the hood to discover several vermin nests. AAA tried then told us it probably, it probably hadn't been driven in over two, two or three years before they towed it to the junkyard. Unlike my beard, the nest... The nest residents in Uncle Sam's SUV had abandoned their nest. Unfortunately, the father mouse living in my beard came from old money and hired the best human lawyer in the state of Maine. I was sued for my own home. Somehow, the time the mouse spent, the mouse family lived in my facial hair gave them squatters' rights to my house and potential co-ownership despite that they weren't on the deed listed on the deed, and never contributed to upkeep or bills. Somehow, the fact that I was unaware of family of mice thrived in my beard ecosystem was equivocated with the adage, ignorance of the law is no excuse. We entered into mediation. The mice were very clean, sanitary people. They reside in a guest bedroom and share the utility bills and property taxes now. We sometimes play Monopoly marathons like my human family did when I was growing up. The mother mouse had attended quarter, quarter, the Cordon Bleu and has been giving me gourmet cooking lessons. I play checkers and backgammon with the kids who call me Uncle Brian. The father has taken it upon himself to teach me chess. He humors me after every game he wins that one day I'll whoop his ass. Of course, as a youth, he studied under a famous Russian chess master. He has warned me to never grow out my wily what wire hair terrier beard again because I might consider it a rat because I might consider it a rat's nest but to a family of rats it's a luxury home thank you very nice thank you Generalissimo Brian Flanco and now let's bring up a long time participant in the Stone Soup group the Black Seeds Writers Group, and uh, several other groups. Let's welcome up, Jan Rowe. Uh, Hi. Uh, this is called Talent Show. Richie Berman's Talent Show fundraiser was quite the success last Wednesday at Emanuel Church, Newberry Street by Tiffany's Jewelry Store near Boston's Public Garden. For about two hours, the assembled talent sang, danced, read, played piano. Maria Termini, after she sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow, said we were the best audience ever. The, an the angel, the homeless angel from Death of Jesus, a play, inspired us with Leonard Cohen's Alleluia to open the talent show. We all are winners. What a community. I was number 10. Mary and Richie, who has cerebral palsy, um, helped me play Lowell George, Little Feet, and Tower of Power Horns, the Mercenary Territory song. Although I had nervously selected the wrong version, a different one from what I had practiced with. 
but it was fine. So mercenary territory was to soften the shock of what I read, read the addiction. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And now we're going to bring you to the person who will be next week's feature. I'll be putting up the information in the next 12 hours uh, or less. Mr. Um, Richard Spizak, the self-proclaimed poet of three rivers. Um, perfect. For, for, he, he will have a response to whatever the hell happens next Tuesday. Please get out and vote and then please come back to Stone Soup next week and hear this man. Take it away, Richard. Okay, uh, first thing I've got for you is uh, uh, an environmental cause. I'm going to urge that you seek out uh, the Sea Shepherd website and uh, support Captain Paul, who is trying to get asylum. They're trying to jail him for protecting whales. So this is called Free Captain Paul. <clears throat> Captain Paul begs Macron for sweet asylum. Will he be free or will the Japanese whalers deny him? A man who stood bravely above the wave, protecting his brothers just like he should. Sea shepherd sailors so bold and brave. The noble cetaceans, a sea-going tribe, is near, too near to extinction. The sea shepherds seek to help them survive. What will it take? Who must be bribed? Capable of language, a huge complex brain, yet some societies still hunt them for dainties. It's almost insane. He drafted a letter from his prison cell in Nuuk. He asks for asylum. He looks to France to safely dwell. From a prisoner of conscience to the leader of a citadel of liberty. What will Macron do? He knows what to do. He has his duty. SeaShepherd.org to preserve and protect a bulwark of species survival in the face of neglect. Safeguarding marine wildlife. Protecting our long abused oceans from those floating factories, harvesting, and other such bloody notions. Let the carvers be resting. Our brother whales need protecting. The ships are our headquarters, the ocean our mission. We're out on the sea in every condition. We place our people and our ships between marine life and the illegal fishing operations, the last line of defense. We know that we're the very last station, it would seem, from every nation. Patrolling the Vaquita Porpoise Refuge on the brink of extinction to prevent the lights going out in the ocean. Could there, should there be no protection? Is a false notion. Yet for these noble beings, does their life have no meaning? Extinction is forever in a harsh end of dreams. Zero tolerance area, zone of no hunting, a protected place where the vaquita porpoise can't be taken or chased. The Sea Shepherd has shared with the Mexican Navy resources to help them protect the vaquita porpoises. Well, perhaps, and just maybe. The Sea Shepherd provides during net pulls a good working platform to free tangled marine animals and collect scientific data that can be derived therefrom and logged into annals. Free Captain Paul Watson, sign the petition, protect the Sea Shepherds so they can continue their mission. The Paul Watson Foundation protects and preserves the cetacean civilization. Sign today for the goddess's sake. And then uh, one last one is a my little backhanded tribute to the uh, Washington Post, once a noble newspaper, and the LA Times. This is called Disturbingly Spineless. Disturbingly Spineless. Sadly, this is not quite a one of a kindness. That these once giants now equivocate and fall to their knees to lick the cake off the poisonous profit cup. Can't they ever get enough? These two great organs of the press have added to the mess of this stress on democracy and the thrall of craven mediocrity, does this not, do not mistake this for an honorable ambivalence, establish some kind of mortal moral equivalence between these two titanic archaic forces. Wait, hold your horses. <clears throat> Equivalent to what? One urges an end, one urges an end to democracy, urges a surging and burgeoning brutal theocracy lying through its teeth, rich only in hypocrisy, a pseudo-immortal, immoral, wealthy cashocracy, while the other can articulate the stated and startling alternative force where the American Republic stays its glorious and lawful course. She, the VP, comes from working class soil, has supported justice, not roiled and coiled through the courts of the nation with a plethora of charges and countercharges, the endless redundant repetitive equivocation. 
endless, relentlessly restating in a voice that would rattle and cheerlead the mob into a bloody battle. Death headed rattle the endless prattle, gin up the mob to break, murder, and rob. There are always lawless forces who will start and chart the dubious, lugubrious dart, the lie, living lines with refrains of full of roughage that builds on suffrage and victimhood, not at all good in the tiniest of shiniest ways like they should, toward self aggrandizement and a reliance on enemies, ultimately offering violent remedies and reprisals as long as they lead the mob to steal, sheet, and rob. And will these forces compete for your attention? Let me repeat, an informed electorate is justly concerned and filled with alarm. And the press here, and yet the once violent WAPO, <clears throat> once valiant WAPO and the left coast LA Times have lurched and well churched and stomped on a dime. It seems, I mean, almost an impossible crime. Sits on its hands, looks away from the game at the back of the stands, washes its hands. Silent pilot would be quietly proud Aren't they sure that when democracy's door is shuttered? Thank you. Well said and well timed as always, sir. Let's see. I don't know if I can follow up something like that with might be too volatile to have have you and bill lewis in this like back to back we need to break you up with some some different chemical flow let's go to christiana chelly i would love to hear what she has to say next oops let me help you Oh, there sorry. Thanks. Sorry. Um, still haven't figured out the technology of Zoom or whatever. Um, I'm craving conversations that aren't being had. Well, the conversations aren't being had with the people they need to be had with. The conversations I'm having are ha are being had in spaces that have been successfully segregated by people who I'm afraid have, due to their behaviors, preemptively elected the wrong president in. I'm certain who's going to win. I wish everyone would believe in collective power to fight the fascism that everyone is inviting in. I can't pretend it isn't happening. I can't be apathetic to it. I listen to disabled people and people who are being killed by their own families slowly or quickly daily because of the behaviors that are enabling it to happen. It's easy to fight genocide right now, but, and there's a gentle, there's a gentle genocide happening here, but everyone fears it so much that they're unwilling to admit it. So it's just continuing to happen here. I'm done. I don't know what else to say right now. I, that's just off my top of my head. I think that's enough. Uh, thank you. And we'll see you for round two. And now, now we'll go to Bill Lewis. Okay. Well, second. I want to look more there. I get the property. I'm kind of tired for this. I can buy this tape just to sit around and use it while I have the opportunity. Uh, do I look like a dementor yet? Oh, not working. Wait, I can't see anything there. No, no, I gotta get it all. There. Now do I look creepy enough for you? <laughs> okay, I have to. Focus. Relax. Depression, paranoia, feel paranoid, feel... 
Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak <laughs> the hooded Lucas. Over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, as I nodded, nearly lapping, suddenly there came a tapping. I was of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, for tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remembered within a bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had thought to borrow from my book surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken sad uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, tis some visitor entreating entrance of my chamber door, some late night visitor entreating entrance of my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, I said, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came tapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door. That scarce was her, sir, I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing. Doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token. And the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into my chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, surely, I said, there's a something at my window lattice. Let me now see what their ad is and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter. When with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a moment stopped nor stayed he. But with mime of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grame and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, Though thy crest art sure and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear his discourse so plainly. Though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on the pallid bust spoke only. That one word of his soul, and that one word he did outpour. Nothing further, and then he uttered not a feather, then he fluttered. I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown the before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled by the stillness broken, by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless I said, what is utters is his only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and follow faster, to the songs one burden bore, to the dirges of his hope, that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy and smiling, Straight I whirled a cushion seat in front of bust and bird and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy and the fancy thinking. 
what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim and thany gotten ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my good bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lot light loaded o'er, but whose velvet vital lining she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then methinks the air grew stenser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee by the angels, he has sent thee respite, respite and nepenthe from the memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind of penthe and forget the lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, I said, thing of evil, prophet still of bird or devil, whether temper set or tempest tossed thee here ashore, Desolate yet undaunted on this desert isle enchanted, on this home of horror haunted. Tell me, tell me, I implore. Is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Oh, Straven, nevermore. Prophet, I said, thing of evil, prophet still of bird or devil. By the heaven that bends above us, by the God we both adore, tell the soul with sorrow laden if within the distant Aden. It shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parter, beer, bird, or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest of the night's Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as the token of the lie that thou hast spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeing of a demon that is dreaming, and the lap light o'er him streaming, casts his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. It's Bill. But I have to say, the hooded look has been done. Done, well I done. tell you. Well done, sir. Good. That was incredible. I think you should have a one man show on off off Broadway, and then it would then they would say, "Let's take it to off Broadway," and then you'd become the belle of Broadway. I mean, especially with that beautiful hood. Yes, probably, uh, he's in Idaho. That's kind of off, 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 off. That's right. wonderful. To redesign your hood, and then, and then you'd be going up the red carpet at the at the Met Gala in your new hood. You just become everything, and then I'll say, I once was in an online open mic with that guy, and no one would believe me. We can all dream. All right. That's an extra millimeter out of hell. Thank you, Bill. Let's go now to Mr. John. Hi. Um, Kathleen Hulser died on Sunday. I don't know if many of you oh, know no. her, but uh, uh, you do know CCR Chagra, and they lived together for like four years. I just talked to him today, and uh, Kathleen evidently like dropped dead of a heart attack in his arms. And so oh my God, that's awful! He's, he's like she he's like kind of broken up. up. Um, if if you if you know him, uh, you might want to give him some support or something. I'll reach uh, out to him. Yeah, yeah. Um, so okay. Anyway, anyway, the story Cape Lobo, uh, the uh, drug addled congressman Earl Saltseeder uh, has uh, got kind of got caught in a, in a bad in an embarrassing situation. So he's uh, decided to lead an 
expedition up the Amazon to find the mythical creature, the Cape Lobo. And we'll pick up where we started last time. Salt Cedar and Moonbee shared a 72-foot boat called the Rio Alucinao with a crew of three. The mechanic they called Colginero was from Sao Paulo. He was wrapped too tight for the Amazon, probably too tight for Sao Paulo. Lanza was a famous surfer from south of Tierra del Fuego. To look at him, you'd think he'd never skinned and eaten an emperor penguin in his life. Then there was Pereira, the Comandante. It might have been Salt Cedar's expedition, but it sure as hell was Comandante's boat. Up ahead, you'll see the meeting of the waters, where the dark water of the Rio Negro runs parallel to the lighter water of the Amazon. Comandante knocked an ash off his cigar. We'll head east for a few clicks, enter the Amazon, and turn up river. Salt Cedar watched the two colors of water running parallel as the city slipped away before the boat turned. The Amazon was a muddy highway plied by river boats hauling rubber, cacao, wood, and minerals downstream and supplies upstream, but reality bored him, so he returned to his lower deck cabin. Before mooching Moonbees blow or raiding the medical supplies for Oxy, he checked his satellite phone. Uncle Bob had sent a video. Salt Cedar downloaded it to his laptop and hit play. Earl Salt Cedar is soft on cryptids. A clean cut man in a utility vest stood in front of a fuzzy image of Bigfoot. While he's on holiday in Brazil, a host of evil critters are terrifying, honest, hard working Americans. Bigfoot, Mothman, the Honey Island Swamp Monster, Loveland Frog, Chupacabra, and Michigan Dogman are destroying pets, livestock, and even children too small to defend themselves. And what does Congressman Salt Eater do about it? He puts the needs of Brazilians before those of his own constituents. When you send me to Congress, I'll get to the bottom of this conspiracy to hide the truth. Vote Wayne Kudzu in the September 10th primary. While my opponent spreads lies from his false church mansion, I'm braving jaguars and poisonous snakes in the rainforest. Pulse hammering from cocaine, salt cedar gestured toward the steer they'd paid villagers to slaughter. As you can see, the copy lobo is close, but don't believe me. Listen to the villager oppressed by this bloodthirsty predator. Moonbee turned the video camera to a local woman who said something in Portuguese. It didn't matter what. Salt Cedar's campaign would add suitable subtitles in post. I promise you this, Salt Cedar said once the camera turned back to him. I will not rest until America wins the global war on cryptids. I'm Earl Salt Cedar, and I approve this message. While Earl Salt Cedar enjoys the tropical sun, I'm in Alaska hunting the Tizuak with state-of-the-art sonar. Wearing a parka over his cable-knit sweater, Wayne Kudzu stood on a fishing boat's rocking deck. Rest assured that as your congressman, I'll prioritize keeping Americans safe. No sea monster is going to snatch innocent victims off the docks on my watch. I'm Wayne Kudzu, and I approve this message. By the time Salt Cedar saw the video, Kudzu's lies were halfway around the world, while Truce Hangnail caught on a sock when it was trying to put on its shoes. It wasn't like Salt Cedar was the paragon of veracity, but come on! Who could believe this nonsense? He needed to answer Kudzu's affront with something big. And we'll pick it up in the second round. Let's get to the second round after we finish the first round. I thought I was going to read a crouton poem, but I haven't done a crouton poem in two weeks because my schedule got thrown off completely and I'm hoping to catch up. But of course, this means this week I have till Friday to get caught up and write three crouton poems. So we'll see if I can actually do that. Good Christ. Um, <laughs> let's... Right away, I don't want to do it. I'm like, ugh. But uh, we'll see what happens. But um, let's go now to Oddball Magazine's own uh, James Van Loy. And by the way, uh, check out the horror thon that's going on 
um, until the end of the week at Oddball Magazine. Uh, all contributors and a special thanks to Robert Fleming for providing the banner art. More to come. And uh, thank you guys for checking that out. And thanks for checking out this man's work every week. Published every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Let's welcome up Mr. James Van Loy. Thanks, Chad. So I do have this uh, Halloween poem here, so I'm yes. going to read that. This is Halloween 2024. Halloween, he say forcefully, uh, it's not about candy. Oh, no, no, no. It's much more ancient than that. All Hallows Eve, the seasonal turn into something else that has to do with sacrifice innocent human lives given over to same strange rite of atonement at one moment, time when everything goes so timeless, the weather itself, something else, endless year of rain suddenly turns into this something else like that moment, the quadrennial horse race loses all joy, and the candidates, oh, the candidates come up out of their graves, zombie politicians speaking the old words of spells like they don't know it has all changed into something else. Oh, something else, all cobwebs and something musty, horrible, clutching dust in your throat and bringing with it the final, last election. Oh. And uh, let me uh, sing a... Uh, Quick song here. Roll out the barrel. We'll have a barrel of fun. Roll out the barrel. We've got the blues on the run. Zing, boom, torero, bring out a song of good cheer. Now's the time to roll out the barrel, for the gang's all here. There is a tavern in the town, in the town, and there my true love sits her down, sits her down, and drinks her wine as merry as can be and never never thinks of me fare thee well for i must leave thee do not let this parting grieve thee and remember that the best of friends must part must part adieu adieu kind friends adieu yes adieu i can no longer stay with you stay with you I'll hang my heart on the weeping willow tree, and may the world go well with thee. Zing, boom, torero, ring out a song of good cheer. Now is the time to roll out the barrel, for the gang's all here. Halloween. So this week is our scariest for some time to come. Let us go now back to the beginning with uh, Mr. I hope he's still here. Oh my God, did the press the icon go? It looks like he left. Oh, that's too bad. And he doesn't seem to be checking in. So unfortunately, Brian Franco has lost a turn. Well, he hasn't lost a turn. He's just not here to take it. If he comes back, we'll, uh, of course, have him back on the mic. But for now, we switch back to uh, Jan Rowe, the unexpected number one. There you go. Okay. Thank you. This is in the 
1960s in Brownsville, Pennsylvania, before it was considered an abandoned town. I'm thankful it was very alive. This is where the um, alley we often bicycled in, but it was uh, intersecting the street, connected uh, Water Street with uh, Monongahela River over the hill to Second, where we lived along the Methodist church where our grandma, whose husband died age 22 of TB. Well, anyway, the big kids demanded our candy. We had the big brown grocery bags. I was the eldest, Sue is Bill, my sister Bobby and me. Bill, Bill and I gave up our candy, but Bobby, she wouldn't. So they ripped the bag and the candy spilled on the ground. My mother made her share her candy with Bill and me. So a payback was at Easter. I, it was the first sight of my Easter uh, basket, uh, the solid chocolate. Bunny had no ears, but bore her, my younger sister Bobby's teeth marks. So she, the ears were eaten off <clears throat> with the tooth imprint matching my younger sister's. But she denies this to this day. And I mean, I'm 72. She just turned 70. So um, that's my <laughs> Halloween <laughs> trick-or-treat oh. event. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Come bringing back Richard Spizak. They could tell she ate it because of the tooth mark sounding oh, remains of the years. They matched. I thought I made that clear. <laughs> I just wanted to accentuate it. Now I'm going to take you on a long trip to the old abandoned length of the uh, Silk Road to a place in Samarkand called the Thousand Buddha's Cave, where manuscripts were found on the dry and dust encrusted cavern floor now lost, once folded rolls of parchment bound, a long lost bounty of praiseful poetry, a deluge of facts borne up in these mystic tracks out on the periphery. Could this prove to be what legends and mysteries seem to be? Our history drains slowly out in the dusty sands in the swirling, whirling edge of the ancient silk road, clouded, shrouded in mist, of history compounded in mantra sounded. 29 hours away, out along the old silk road, some would say. And although this long lost sandily abandoned, hidden slyly away, there, long forgotten in the land of wind-swept unknown sins except by the adept. Along the quiet river dawn, the ancient silent Buddhas whispered their prayers, though largely abandoned long ago by man. Nearby, a nomad's lonely yurt, as a distant time as ancient daughter's childhood flirt. In the Gansu province, the heroic warrior god Nirana guards the thousand Buddhas every way he can from the ten thousand slowly shifting dunes of all penetrant sand, demands of an almost fluid, eternal, Drifting mountain of sculpted sand, the weary pilgrim wanders from cavern to cavern, each enveloped in its own tale of mystery, long hidden history, obscured, nearly lost, amongst the most remotest memories of fickle man. Each delicate step, intricately placed by Asparus, adept, so noted for his singing and dances as he wept and flew, foot fluted, well past the western tower of the Great Wall, unknown to most since long lost the lost path of the Silk Road's laugh. The skill of man made these caves of thousand Buddhas, by the hand of God made what would behold as the lake of the crescent moon. Nearby fields stolen from the hungry desert by the impertinent planting of poplar trees, which protect the land from the sand bearing punishing, polishing winds and the relentless, eternally tireless dancing and slowly advancing dunes. The light that shines through the universe, the timeless truth and compassionate, the virtuous solution for all its inestimable worth on earth. Yang Guan Lu knew what to do. The itinerant Taoist monk began his restoration, that much he knew, and the cave of a thousand Buddhas rises slowly from its sandy grave, this much 
also, he said, was true. West of Magao Caves were these thousand Buddhas somehow saved. Thank you. Have a good on good authority that uh, Brian Franco made it made his way back here. So um, he missed his he missed his number one spot, but he's all the way down to number three. I, th I think it uh, I think it needs uh, another uh, clown laugh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you might want to <laughs> go to someone so I can pull something up real quick. Cause... Okay, sure. Uh, Christiana Chelli, you're next on the list. Here, let me help you. There you go. Hi, so do you guys want a song or a random page? A song. There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somewhere through the rainbow Way up high There's a land that I heard of Once in a lullaby Somewhere Skies are blue, and a dream that you dare to dream really do come true. Someday I wish upon a star to wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Where troubles melt like lemon drops all oh, way above the chimney tops. That's where you'll find me. Somewhere through the rainbow, skies are blue. No, 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 no. What's the next words? No. Someday Bluebirds I wish fly. upon a star. Oh, where? Someday I wish upon a star. Oh, where? No. Some. Huh? Someday I'll wish upon a star and end up where the clouds are far behind me. Behind me. Away where troubles melt like rum and drops. Away above the That's where you find me. Guys, are blue? Is that it? No, bluebirds fly. Blue. No, no, no. But yeah. then it's blue, blue, blue birds fly. No, where's the birds fly over the rainbow? Why birds then? Oh, why can't I? Over the rainbow, yes. Why then oh, why can't I? Thank you. <laughs> and now. And now we'll bring you, uh, I think, I think uh, the Generalissimo has prepared. He has a battle plan. He is ready. Yes, yes. Can I do a couple of haikus along with my poem? Because I was in, in this workshop. Sure. sure. And so these are some voting haikus. I have never told who I voted for because I don't have to. That's number one. Number two, those who decide to not vote might vote for someone they don't expect to. And then I have a, a, a just a tanka. If it's stormy out, you should weather the weather because it matters whether you brave the weather because every vote counts. Okay. And this is a, a, a currently untitled poem. Parsley is a word I always misspell. Every time I type 
that word, it gets underlined in red. It's like spelling business, which is a whole nother story. I also understand another is not a real word. But to return from this unnecessary tangent, I really dig parsley. It's on my list of fake foods with mangoes, which is another whole nother story. I always thought of parsley as a garnish no one ate or a sacred place on the Seder plate. I, it was an ingredient whose flavor got lost in the shuffle in every recipe, sometimes something almost inconsequential, like a wallflower at a seventh grade sock hop. Then one day I went to a Middle Eastern restaurant and on the appetizer plate with the stuffed grape leaves, hummus, baba ganoush, and lavash was tabbouleh. Parsley was front and center as a flavor accented by lemon juice, olive oil, and garlic. 11-year-old me had to ask the waiter what this was made of. But parsley was a garnish I wasn't supposed to eat. Parsley was an herb that was always blended with other herbs. The only time I saw fresh parsley at my house was on Passover. Parsley became my first culinary obsession. I started cooking pars parsley into scrambled eggs, sprinkling it atop open-faced grilled cheeses, and souped up frozen pizzas without other herbs. After I had veal marsala in Boston's North End. I made my first homemade chicken marsala. Mom said veal was too expensive. With mushrooms, a little salt and pepper, marsala, and a good amount of parsley. It was so good, everyone's plate was cleaned. Tabula is still one of my favorite things to order, and I wince when it's made with too much garlic. My first garden was a container garden with over 40 herbs. I grew parsley in an old wheelbarrow. There was more than enough to make tabbouleh, parsley, pistachio, pesto, grilled cheeses, and, and I even shared my bounty with friends and neighbors. That was the same year I invented mango oregano salad dressing. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And now, Bill Lewis, how can he top what he previously did? I don't know, but he better put the hood back on for the mystique's sake. Oh! I was in 2012 in Tampa, Florida for the Republican National Convention, where this gentleman here, whom you may or may not recognize as the man with the boot on his head, Vermin Supreme, had himself a megaphone, and as the, what was the Westboro Baptist Church was preaching their glories of whatever the hell they were saying, he lent me his microphone, and we were singing, me and another guy, oh, uh, Portello, uh, we were singing somewhere over the rainbow to the Westboro Baptist Church. So, <laughs> They, they did not appreciate the elegance of the... <clears throat> but something happy and relaxed and happy. We need happiness in this world. There's enough upset. So kayaking on the Charles River. <clears throat> Stay to the right, pass to the port. Never forget, you're the slowest boat. Down river is Harvard and Boston City. Up river is nothing, though it is fairly pretty. The turtles on logs and dragonflies on sticks, the geese and the ducks make a terrible mix. Closer to shore, it's more of a battle, with lily pads and duckweed and all stuck to your paddle. There's no rush, however, no need to hurry. Just float with the current, you don't have to worry. Float with the ducks and the geese and the turtles, it's no problem at all. There are no nasty hurdles. Just for a moment, the boat is your earth. It's all that you have. It's all that you're worth. So rejoice in your fortune. Revive, re, re, revel in your revolve. Blah, blah, blah. Revel in your dream. Take a break from the real world and just float down the stream. Thank you, Bill. And up next, we have part two by John Wesick, or part nth. I forget what part he's at now. I think it's four now. I'm not sure. Yeah, Let's something go. like that. Okay. 
The man's a genius. While the world scientists say that Cape Lobo doesn't exist, he honed in like a missile on a village ravaged by the beasts. It's like the elites are perpetrating some kind of cover-up, man. Moonbee pointed and the camera panned to a group of Amazonian Indians holding bows. In deference to America's prudishness, the women wore vote salt cedar t-shirts instead of going topless. There it is! Moonbeam pointed to a hairy shape dashing into the jungle. Salt Cedar racked his pump action shotgun with a blank and gave chase. Moonbee and Lance on camera followed. The latter kept the video rolling using shaky cam to heighten the action without letting viewers get a close look at Cojinero and furs and a paper mache skull. Salt Cedar fired, racked the shotgun, and followed Cojinero into a clearing. Cojinero emitted a roar, then a creature with an anteater's head emerged from the bushes, opened its mouth, and extended its barbed tongue 15 feet. The tip penetrated Cojinero's chest and he fell to the rainforest floor. Salt Cedar and the others skidded to a stop. Moonbee and Lanza turned and ran while Salt Cedar stood in shock, trying to understand what he had just seen. Signals bounced around his drug addled brain as if his amygdala and prefrontal cortex were bumpers in a pinball machine. The flashing light spelled, Oh shit! and he fled. As the hooves pounded behind him, pounding behind him got closer, Salt Cedar realized a real Capilobo had murdered Cojinero and was after him. He mumbled prayers to God, Vishnu, Buddha, Uhura, Mazda, Zeus, and any other deities he could think of. Then he tripped over a root and plowed face first into the rainforest floor. Salt Cedar scrambled to his feet, but a twisted ankle couldn't bear his weight. Smelling of rotten meat, the Cape Lobo moved closer. Salt Cedar gripped a shotgun like a baseball bat for a last ditch defense. When all seemed lost, a seven foot creature resembling a hairy man emerged from the bushes and pounced on the Cape Lobo. The latter tried to turn and bite, but Salt Cedar's savior had gotten behind it and used his massive hands to squeeze the salt capilobo's windpipe in a matter of seconds the fight was over my dear boy salt cedar's savior asked in an oxbridge accent that sounded like james mason's are you all right who are you my friends call me blinky i'm a mapinguari we're the capilobo's sworn enemies it's a good thing i came by when i did let's get you home and take a look at that ankle Blinky scooped Salt Cedar up and set off. Branches whipped past Salt Cedar's face as his benefactor sprinted, a dizzying array of jungle paths. After a half hour, they arrived at a clearing that contained the Mapanguari's hut. It was a small structure with a grass roof that rested on a raised wooden platform. A diesel generator hummed nearby, and a cable ran up the bark of a Brazil nut tree to a satellite dish sticking above the canopy. Blinky took Salt Cedar inside, moved a copy of the Golden Bow off a cot, and set the congressman down to examine his ankle. Nothing's broken. The Mapinguari took an ice pack from the refrigerator and wrapped it around Salt Cedar's angle. Probably a sprain. Stay your feet and keep icing it for 24 hours. Refrigerator? Satellite dish? Where did you get all this tech? Salt Cedar asked. I extract DMT from Yahe and trade it with the locals. Blinky loaded a pipe. Wanna try some? Hell yeah! Any doubt Salt Cedar had about his benefactor vanished after his first toke. On the inhale, he was sitting on a cot in a hut. On exhale, he saw the green-skinned Chinese waitress motioning him to inhale a heroic dose. The walls grew transparent, and he saw dozens of frogs and lizards watching him from its wooden frame. He realized the lizard people were, were not his enemies, but were Earth's protectors. 
then he was the rainforest green chlorophyll ran through his veins as he inhaled carbon dioxide and exhaled the oxygen that supports life the distinction between subject and object dissolved and all humanity's categories became meaningless libraries caught chicken pox and methane samba with euclidean geometry space and time divided into atoms of pure consciousness each carrying the tiny saws and hammers they used to construct reality seeing where einstein and quantum physics had gone wrong salt cedar burst into giggles it all made so much sense he wanted to write down his insight but couldn't reach for a pen and paper salt cedar woke up naked on the river bank all the metaphysics and philosophy had evaporated like gasoline on a summer sidewalk. He only remembered his mission to design cars that run on high fructose corn syrup. Even though he had no engineering knowledge, he was sure to succeed. How hard could it be? After missing in the Amazon rainforest for two weeks, Congressman Earl Saltseeder reappeared wearing only a loincloth. The congressman told reporters he was retiring from politics, but gave no indication of his future plans. I'm Julia Kanazawa for CNN. We used dipropyl tryptamine. It's like DMT on steroids. Uncle Bob, that's uh, the uh, political, political advisor, turned off the TV and set down the remote. The nomination's yours, although I still feel a little guilty. Like you said, the man was a liability. I don't have to tell you what it means if the other party takes control of Congress. It means medical bills wouldn't bankrupt working families, and they could afford to send their children to college. Neither of us want that. Wayne Kudzu handed Uncle Bob an envelope of cash. Here's the final payment for the actors and a little leftover for you. Feel better now? And that is the end of Copy Lobo. Thank you. Bravo! Please send a bravo. link to that. I cannot wait to get a copy of that in my hands and actually read it. I just want to say you have the best character names of anyone. Your character names are fantastic. And please send us a link once that's published. What a great idea. Yeah. To, to run a car on high fructose corn syrup and, and not use it in pecan pies ever again. Yeah. Um, you know, the uh I listened to a, a Behind the Bastards episode about uh RFK Jr. And evidently, RFK Jr. Uh, did take part in some sort of expedition while he was strung out on heroin. And uh, they said that uh, he had control of the medical supplies and all the uh, all the painkillers. So that was the inspiration. You know, my brother was saying that he he was listening to some things, some RFK Jr. videos. And he says, I don't know if he would have made that bad of a president. I think that he was trying to joke he was making a joke with it because you know my brother he's he's not an rfk jr type of guy but it was very weird thing for him to, he, he'll do that to me sometimes he'll say something that sounds very convincing in his voice because he knows how to keep a straight voice but it kind of scared me well thank you john and we're gonna We're going to uh, phase out tonight with a performance by uh, our closing poet, Mr. James Van Loy. I don't know if you have anything Halloween-esque to end with, but I'm sure you have something. Uh, I have here a labyrinth is fin de siècle. Fin de siècle. Labyrinth is fin de siècle. There he is, waiting for me in the day program hall, the hardest homeless, not helpless, full-time warrior against all those motherfucking pieces of holy shit, shit-bag, cunt, bastard abusers of the needy and poor who snaky sneak their way through social services, chasm between what people so need and what exists. So, this honey badger wolverine of unaddressed abuse and unforgivable neglect has finally experienced love in the form of his doctors, or docs, 
seven month old baby little girl whose great eyes have smitten his black hole of angry, complete emptiness to leave even he wondering that he of all people could be feeling this fine way. So now he has written what he calls his only real poem, but slips back into his long convoluted reconstruction of all the horrors that have been perpetuated upon him, and indeed to all trapped within all the poorhouse walls of staff who always back each other and supervisors who won't listen and structures that never, ever could change. But all he has to do is reread his piece, his only one poem of the irresistible, yes, devastating little beauty, this ember, and he glows again. His Jack Nicholson-like hardness melts and his face and eyes light up like Ebenezer Scrooge alive after the final angel, final night, with hard gray lined face gaunt with diabetes, taking on the hue of health, and at least momentarily, he is for once fully alive, and he is able to see what he never saw before so intense he is ready to kill, for that small innocent being who could make him feel so much for just this one short time, in his incredibly long, so long, miserable 52 years, what he never thought he could feel. Oh, such wonder and joy in the simple, total love for another. And here's a song for you in Dutch called Oh, my blauwe geschulte. This it is toy, gugabuka veta, apakat. Van matte kapier, morn is en ek weid versleta, en ek vlieg bek aan die meer, en de tijd ek niks is reise, nor quivreen of nor pointje, viel ek somtijds in den treise, wet a vaar appeared aan zee, o my na blauwe geschopte, guys aan my leveling stoi, Oh, my na blauwe geschopte, geliebt in the bovis de schoi, geseek up a cut, a crack on my cut. Ik had a toiv a cut to lift up. It was a vinnig and a nap. Moord moest up some a difka, spielen up a bit o scop. And then floated for to finna. Ik wil pa ma lifke zijn, kwam ik dan eens eens te pinna, dan was doiva katte kwijn. O mijn blauwe geschopte, guys aan mijn leveling stoi. O mijn blauwe geschopte, geliekt in de bovis de schei. De seeg op een kat, de krak van mijn kat. De seeg op een kat, de krak van mijn kat. Ik ze nou en ik ze een verse leta, dat voor een duif niet mee. Alle man is mij vergeten, daar is niemand die nog zee. O mijn blauwe geschopte, ga ze mijn leveling stoi. O mijn blauwe geschopte, geliekt in de boy was de schel. Ga ze op een kat, de krak van mijn kat. Ga zeep op een kat, de krak van mijn kat. Ga zeep op een kat, de krak van mijn kat. Thank you. Peace. Thank you. Thank you, James. And thanks to everyone who came out tonight for quick open mic. I guarantee you that next month will be chock full of features. The first will be Richard's next Wednesday following voting day when hypothetically there will be a decision at some point. Uh, we'll, we, will, we will find out and uh, comment on that as it happens. And then we will have uh, Tim Gager featuring on the uh, Excuse me, we'll have Tim Gager featuring on the uh, 13th, and then I believe Silent E is scheduled to feature on the uh, 20th, and we'll have, and so on and so forth, and we will keep on going uh, to the end of the year, and I hope you guys, I hope you guys uh, stick with us as we might be uh, marching on to the end of history, and um, 
we'll see how it goes. Uh, until then, keep writing, keep performing, take care of yourselves, take care of everyone else, and don't forget to do the wave for the obligatory photo. Thank you again, and have yourselves an excellent evening. And don't forget to wear your hood and uh, wait for your get out of hell free card. <laughs> Thank you guys and have yourselves a great evening. Thanks everybody. Take care.